Great. So today I, I'll uh, talk, look at the rest of clothing insulation climate, particularly climate, uh, and then start into air conditioners actually is the next topic. And I, I, I just filmed and, and crunching uh, the lecture video for air conditioners, so I'll put it up after class, but we'll get part way into that anyway. Uh, so the, the first thing is, a, is a, a question that came up last time and I didn't get a chance to answer it, and it was, have you ever been on the news for anything else? And if so, can we see it? And the short answer is, yeah, I, 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 I've been fortunate, I guess, to have done a lot of television uh, over the years, and, um, sometimes on the news, sometimes on uh, the Capitals sports um, for hockey, and I actually did a, a year of discussion as co-host of a Discovery television show, too. So lots of fun and games. I would say, just in sort of a summary of, it's, it's a seductive activity. It is exasperating, too. It's like, those of you who are interested in going into media, um, more power to you. It's, it's a complicated life. And so I've had a chance to do it as like not my day job, which is kind of fun. Uh, that said, OK, so the second part of the question is, Anything else? And if so, can we see it? And I realized, you know, I never, you know, yes, I've done a bunch of these things. And so here's, here is another one. Yay. <laughs> you guys now are prepared to, to, to deal with the physics of this one. And now, John, myth number four. Myth number four. I heard this one when I was a kid. A penny dropped from the top of the Empire State Building could kill a pedestrian below. People at the Empire State Building thought it would. Anybody who gets hit by that penny is about to die, because that's a long way for a penny to fall. And people here agree. Oh, it'd kill them, for sure. If it hit the ground hard enough, it might flatten out into a quarter or something. Those people were standing at the top of America's tallest building, the Sears Tower in Chicago. If it hit somebody, I think it'd really hurt them. Stupid penny. That's what happens in this Tony Award-winning musical. The puppet throws a penny off the top of the Empire State Building and strikes her romantic rival below, breaking her neck. What happened to her? Some idiot threw a penny off the Empire State Building. I heard that the penny would go through someone's head. People said it would be like a bullet. It would kill you. <laughs> They're thinking of a world without air. Physicist Lou Bloomfield. But air is a, is a big deal for little things. It, uh, it slows down leaves, it slows on raindrops, and it slows on pennies. But a penny's heavier than a raindrop. They catch a lot of wind, very unstable in the air, and it just flutters. Bloomfield tackles the penny myth in his book, How Everything Works. We kept hearing about pennies. They dent the sidewalk. Well, it's, it's human intuition. You think, whatever it is I'm holding is up there at the Empire State Building. This is really bad news. I've always heard if you drop a penny from this high up, it would clearly uh, kill someone. Not a pleasant thought. I don't want to try it, but it would be kind of interesting to find out. It would, but how would you test it? The ideal thing would be to, to drop a penny off the Empire State Building and catch it. But sadly, no building will let us do this because they're all worried about the myth. So at our request, Bloomfield concocted another test. He filled this balloon with helium and attached a penny dispenser to it. It just spits out one penny at a time. He launched the balloon hundreds of feet into the air, then a remote control device released the pennies and he ran around trying to catch them. Oh. <laughs> I bounced off my hand. My sister said, you, you catch like I a clam. Who doesn't have... You never did catch it. I didn't catch it because I'm a oh. bad catch. <laughs> and it was a windy day. Oh, yeah. Where'd he go? Oh! <laughs> it surprised me! Did you catch that? It's like getting hit with a bug. It hit me right in the chin. It was noticeable, but nothing more. I was just disappointed I hadn't caught the thing. So a penny won't hurt me, but you don't want people throwing things off tall buildings. Other things would hurt. That's right. If they're aerodynamically streamlined, something like a ballpoint pen, they'll reach the point at which they're going a couple hundred miles an hour, and that's dangerous. Don't dump your handbag out the top of a building. Something in that bag is likely to go awfully fast. <laughs> okay. 
So you guys now know the physics of this. It, I actually measured the speed at which pennies descend through air. It's about 25 miles an hour, which is not bad. Um, and somebody who actually can catch anything could catch them. I can't catch anything, so <laughs> they were just raining on me. All right, pressure drag. Yeah, there you go. All right, so back to, to, to business. Uh, another question that came in this morning was, was you know, clothing insulation and climate. I told you that, that most objects are, are black in the infrared, which is to say that they emit thermal radiation as efficiently as, as is possible at, at ordinary temperatures. Uh, is, you know, what's a white object in the infrared was the question. And the metals, the metals uh, conducting surfaces generally are, are effectively white in the infrared. Or they're, they're either mirrored if they're shiny if they're smooth, if they're, uh, if they're matte, if they're structured or sanded, then they're effectively white. They, they still reflect light beautifully, but they, but they lose memory of where the light came from, so they become white rather than shiny. You okay with the idea that, that a white object is, and the distinction between a white object and a shiny object, a uh, mirrored object, is, is simply the loss of memory of, of where the light came from. White objects send light off. Wherever light came from, they send it sort of in every direction anyway. And you lose that you lose that what's called a specular reflection. You don't see the the an image of what was out there setting light, and you you just see illumination generally. Okay. All right. Well, where I where I left off the things I left off with clothing insulation climate are really things uh, relevant right now in the West, where there are a lot of fires raging. Uh, if you get caught in a fire in a, if you get caught in a fire, the firefighters, they get caught in the fires. They carry with them an emergency tent that, to, to protect them against the fire, or at least allow them to survive the fire. And it makes use of, of all the, the ideas I've talked about up until now, trying to, trying to keep, uh, from, you know, keep them cool in, in, the, in the midst of the fire. It's an aluminum tent. And the idea is basically they, they scrape the ground clean so there's nothing to burn under them. So they don't want convection coming up at them. They want to be the lowest thing in the, store, in the situation. So that convection, after all, natural convection takes heated air rises, right? So if you're, if you're very low, it's unlikely that heated air will get to you because it's going to be going above you. So they go low. They lie down under a, an aluminum tent. And why aluminum? to, 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 to um, block thermal radiation exchange. So they're in an insulated, uh, uh, they're in a system that's insulated against thermal radiation. So although the burning trees around them will be radiating furiously at them, both in the infrared and actually even in the visible because the burning trees are hot enough to emit thermal radiation that's in the visible, the aluminum will reflect it. So they should get relatively little um, thermal radiation coming to them. And the last thing is that they try not to touch the tent while they're in it, so, so as to avoid thermal conduction. So when it's finally, uh, it's a last ditch effort. And periodically it happens that firefighters get trapped by a rapidly progressing uh, fire that, that just sweeps over them. It's not what they want to have happen, but they can survive it, uh, ideally, in, underneath one of these aluminum tents. Does that make sense? Um, okay. The other thing to talk about, windows. Uh, properly designed, modern, yeah? Will that tent keep you cool on a hot day? In principle, yeah. So if you go under an aluminum surface, uh, the sunlight's reflected, right? So, so it's, uh, you want to keep, that's why you go in the shade. I mean, anything that blocks the sunlight, uh, to some extent, squelches thermal radiation. But if you want to keep even the thermal radiation of all the other hot objects around you away from you, wrap yourself up in aluminum. Um, it's, yeah. They used to sell something called space blankets. When I, actually, it was when I was a kid. You could get a space blanket. But it sort of came, as I recall, it came with approximately no instructions about how to use it. And I only know how to use it. And I, I took it to camp even, trying to stay warm in a canoeing camp. But I never knew which side you're supposed to face in and face out, because I didn't. Either I didn't read the instructions or no one gave them to me. In any case, it's got this, the space blankets would have one shiny, aluminized side. And since you're going to be touching this thing, 
having the aluminized side on the inside makes no sense because you're going to be exchanging heat with that surface by contact, by, by conduction. So the aluminum side goes on the outside. So, oh well, note to my old, to, to my, my, my kid's self way back when, put the shiny side out. Is that okay? If you ever get one of these blankets, shiny side out. All right. Um, windows, I just want to talk about modern windows. I'm just cherry picking some of the topics. The best of modern windows, first of all, they're, they're double pane, which I hope you, you know, uh, this, is, this is relevant to, to the problem set, but I'll, but I'll say it anyway. You deserve credit for being here. Modern windows are double pane. That uh, separates the two pieces of glass by a gas layer in between. And the gas layer, when the window's vertical, the gas layer makes a relatively good insulator between the two panes of glass, which are themselves not terribly good insulators, because air is a, gases are terrible thermal conductors. And furthermore, they, although they can go undergo um, convection, the convection cell it forms is a very tall, thin thing. It's not very effective at carrying heat from one window to the other. What can carry heat from one window to the other still is thermal radiation, which is, this is why I'm bringing it up. And it's relevant to the question that came in about what's white in the infrared. The, the two panes facing each other can exchange heat by thermal radiation. So even if you had no gas in the middle, which, which, which isn't possible, which would be wonderful, but you can't do it because atmospheric pressure will crush that system. You need the air inside to prevent crushing. You need the gas inside. Um, but the thermal radiation won't be blocked even if you had no, no air in there. So how do you block it? Well, put a mirror surface in one, mirror one surface of the glass. That is, make it shiny. And I showed you last time the, the, the glass contain, the glass doers that are, that are mirrored to, to avoid thermal radiation. Um, you may still get thermos bottles that are mirrored inside. I don't know, that, do they sell thermos bottles that are, that are, that are glass anymore or are those gone? They, they, were, they were popular when I was a kid. They always broke on me. So I would have my hot chocolate or whatever it was in a thermos bottle. And it would, by the time I got ready to drink the hot chocolate, the glass would have broken and it would be a, yeah, sad but very memorable. <sighs> anyway, the mirror, mirroring is good. So, so you put that in there. If you, if you mirror one of the surfaces of glass, the thermal, the thermal radiation from that surface becomes uh, zero. It can't, it, a mirror doesn't radiate thermal radiation. And the other pane of glass simply sees its own, re it, its own reflection. So they do not exchange thermal radiation to speak of. Of course, if you truly mirror a window, you can't see through it. So you know, what are you going to do? How do they actually do it? They mirror it in the infrared. They put on a coating that is reflective in the infrared and transparent in the visible. All right? So in the infrared, this reflection trick works. And that's, that's the range of thermal radiation. Uh, thermal radiation from ordinary stuff like us and the room, it's all in the infrared. And so this mirror trick works. But in the visible, the, the surface is transparent. And you might think this is real exotica, like you've got a, a, a surface that it's, it's shiny in the infrared, and yet it's transparent in the visible. It's used everywhere. The, 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 that technique is, is the basis of all this electronic gadgetry. You, you, you all with your laptops and cell phones, you are looking through a transparent conductor at the, at the screen. Because they're using le electricity to control the pixels, turn them on and off, red, green, all that stuff. They're using electricity to do that, and yet you have to be able to see through them. So it's using transparent conductors everywhere. And the, the, the physics of how a conductor can be transparent in the visible to visible light and yet reflective to, to infrared light, that's, that's a little bit complicated solid state physics and not something that, that's terribly important for this. But, but they do exist. They're used in all these displays. So they're, they're very common. And they're also used to coat the one surface of what's called a low emissivity window. The low emissivity idea is that you make a window, one pane of the window has almost no, its emissivity is almost zero. And if I, if I haven't told you recently about emissivity, the emissivity is the measure of how effectively a, a, a surface emits its own thermal radiation. 
and it ranges from zero, which is terrible, to one, which is perfect. Or zero is, that doesn't radiate at all. So low emissivity windows have a, that, essentially that, uh, con that conductive, reflective surface that has almost no emissivity. Emissivity is zero. Is that okay? I mean, some of this is, I, I view as just um, public service announcement because at some point or other, you're going to be worrying about windows in, a, in some building you, you live in. And, you, and at this point, you do want at least double pane windows to be realistically energy efficient. And ideally, you want to have this, this coating in there. The coating does have a downside that, the, or the coatings, the coatings typically don't, don't tolerate things like humidity. So if the window leaks, it's double pane window with gas in between, if air can get in and out of that, that gap and, and, and interact with the coating, it tends to ruin the coating. And so you have also probably seen windows, low emissivity windows, the double panes, that have leaked and look disgusting. They, they, they develop funny colors and all sorts of stuff. Um, and and they, they lose their transparency to some extent. And so then you have to have them replaced and they're not cheap. But you know it's a it's still worth it. All right. Any questions about low emissivity windows? All right. Okay. So so the the more most important part of the, of the story, climate. So it's the it, my goal is to is to give you a basic understanding of why adding more and more complicated molecules to the Earth's atmosphere will cause the surface temperature of the Earth, on average, to increase. And you, you've heard this, surely, you know, this, this, it's a major theme of modern life, the idea of, of climate change and or global warming. Um, those terms are sort of used interchangeably. So I want to give you an idea of the physics behind that, at least one simple explanation for it. This is an explanation, actually, that I, that I, I got from a physics professor, a very uh, brilliant guy at, at, at you know, old friend from MIT, David Pritchard. A simple explanation for, for, the, for why adding all this stuff to the atmosphere will raise the Earth's temperature. So here's the story. The Earth is receiving heat all the time from the sun. Sunlight is, is after all, the sun's thermal radiation. So we're receiving uh, heat from the sun. And if we received heat endlessly and didn't get rid of it, the Earth's temperature would just continue to increase forever, right? You can't just keep getting heat in with, nothing, with no consequences. So the Earth radiates away its own heat. That is, it, re it, it, it can't keep receiving heat forever. Somewhere way back when, it, it received heat and got hotter and hotter, or at least in principle it did. And then eventually it reached an equilibrium. And we're now in this equilibrium situation where the heat's coming in at a certain rate, and we're getting rid of it at the same rate it's coming in, so nothing much is changing. So how are we getting rid of it? We're radiating it away into essentially empty space. Everything but the sun. The sun, the sun of course, is, is very hot, but everything else, all the rest of space, is effectively very cold. The details don't matter there. Okay? So the heat's coming in, the heat's going out. The heat comes in as visible light. The heat goes out as, radi as, as radiation from sort of room temperature stuff. So it's all in the infrared. So we're radiating away, radiating away infrared light. And that balance is struck at a certain temperature of the Earth. That is, if the Earth, if the Earth were, were nearly at absolute zero, we would not be radiating away the heat as fast as it's coming in from, from the sun, and we would be heating up. On the other hand, if the Earth were 1,000 degrees, it would be radiating away too, heat too fast, and it wouldn't be being replaced by the sun right. So we've, we've found a temperature. The Earth has found a temperature at which it's just in balance. Not too hot, not too cold, you know, Goldilocks, all right? And what is that temperature? The temperature that, that's important here is minus 18 degrees Celsius. That is, that is, if the Earth were just a black object, perfect at absorbing and perfect at emitting, and don't worry about the differences in colors and temperatures, it's just, let's let it be black, then the sunlight would be coming in. And, and, and that's a little bit of an oversimplification I don't want to worry too much about. That would, would the sun would come in at its normal rate based on how big the sun is in our sky and you know, how much angle it covers. 
and how hot it is. The, the, the heat would come in as sunlight. It would go out as thermal radiation. It would be in balance. Everything would be dandy, dandy, dandy at minus 18 Celsius. Is that okay? If we were colder, we wouldn't be radiating enough, and we'd get hot. We'd heat up. If we were hotter, we'd be radiating too much, and we'd get colder. We'd balance out <coughs> minus 18. Well, where's minus 18? It's not here on, gr on the ground. It turns out that because the Earth has an atmosphere, the surface from which that light is radiated, the, 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 earth, the light comes in from the sun, rises the Earth, and the Earth radiates it away from where? It radiates it away from a surface, but it's not a specific surface that you can touch exactly. It's, it's, a, it's a complicated compo composite surface that is assembled out of the Earth's surface, the, the physical ground, and the, and the air, the air is involved. The, so it turns out that, that because the air is not perfectly transparent, I mean, it's not perfectly transparent in the visible, but it's certainly not perfectly transparent in the infrared, which is an important part of, of, of the story, the, 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 the thermal radiation coming from the Earth effectively comes from some average of the ground itself, the air here, the air there, it, it comes from an average height above the Earth of about five kilometers. So you can sort of simplify the whole story down and say that the, 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 the sunlight comes in, and th heat comes into sunlight. Heat goes out as, as radiation from essentially a black surface that happens to be located on average at five kilometers above the Earth. You okay with that idea? That, that the thermal radiation doesn't come from the ground. Part of it's from the ground, but the average location from which it comes from is five kilometers up there. So it turns out that's where the, 18, the minus 18 degrees is. It's about, it's about five kilometers above the ground. It's got the right temperature, and it's, it's the effective source of the, of the Earth's thermal radiation. Just as the, in the sun, the sun's got all kinds of temperatures around. The effective location of the sun's thermal radiation comes from what's called the protosphere, which is photosphere, which is you know, a certain region uh, layer near the surface of the sun. So we're radiating away black, black body radiation, the, the radiation as though we were a black object from a height of five kilometers. That said now, the Earth's atmosphere does interesting things with temperature. If, if, you, if you take a, a, a liter of air down here at the Earth's surface, put it in a, in a, in a stretchy in a, in a bag, in a, in, a, in, a, in a floppy plastic bag, and you carry it up to one kilometer above the Earth, up there, the pressure will have dropped. And because the pressure will have dropped, to keep the bag from having a pressure balance across it, the bag is going to have to get bigger. It, it, will, it will swell, expand, as, as, as you carry the bag up, up that kilometer. And as the bag expanded, it will have done work on the surrounding air, pushing that air out of the way. And the consequence is that the air in the bag will have gotten colder. It will have, in doing work on the, on the surrounding air it, and expanding, it will have done work on its environment using the only energy it has, which is thermal energy, and it will got, have gotten colder. So the bottom line there is if you take air down here up, up to a kilometer, it gets colder. Go a kilometer more, it gets colder still. Do the reverse, bring the bag back down, as, it, as you bring it back down, the surrounding air will squish it the, as the pressure builds. The bag gets smaller, the work done on it will heat it up, so the air will get hotter. So it turns out that as air go, moves up and down, if you imagine putting it in an elevator and carrying it up and down, the air's temperature, not only is the air's pressure change, but its temperature changes. And this is unavoidable. It, it creates a pressure grade, ah, temperature gradient in the Earth's atmosphere. It's cool, it's, the higher you go, the cooler the air gets. And you've all experienced this. You go up into the Blue Ridge Mountains and it's, you know, you're not quite a kilometer high uh, above, above Charlottesville, but the temperature has dropped significantly, uh, all things else being equal. So there is a natural temperature gradient in, a, in, in an atmosphere around a, a planet. The, you know, it's got, gravity's involved in this too, and it, so it's all, it's all built in. But the, 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 but the temperature gradient that's sort of in, unavoidable in the Earth's atmosphere is about six, it's about six degrees 
uh, Celsius per kilometer. I think it's 6.6. .6. Water is involved in this too, but it's it, so so as you go up, as you go up uh, one kilometer, you, the temperature drops about 6.6 .6 kilometers, ah, 6.6 .6 degrees Celsius. All right. By the time you go up five kilometers, it will have dropped five times that much, which is about 33 degrees. So up there where it's eight minus 18 at, at five kilometers, it, it, at five kilometers up, it's minus 18. And if you work your way back down to the Earth's physical surface, it's about 15 positive degrees Celsius, plus 15. And that is about the average, and if you average over the whole, whole, the whole globe, the whole uh, year, take the average of all the averages, the Earth's surface temperature is about 15 degrees Celsius. Okay, so you know why is it about 15 degrees Celsius? Then to summarize, it's because to reach uh, thermal energy balance, we need to be a radiating we need to be radiating thermal energy into space as a black body with a temperature of minus 18 Celsius, and that's that eff the effective surface from which we're radi radiating that black body radiation is five kilometers up. So down here five kilometers below that, and therefore 33 degrees Celsius above that, we're at plus 15. Is that okay with everybody? That said then, what happens if we start throwing more and more complicated molecules into the Earth's atmosphere? And complicated molecules, what I mean by that? Uh, the simplest, uh, simple atoms like helium, neon, argon, basically are, do not uh, respond at all to infrared light. I mean, there, maybe there are ways in which they can barely interact with it, but basically the light just goes right by. They, they have all these, these energy levels that you learned about in chemistry and stuff like that, and they cannot interact with light that doesn't uh, move, move electrons from one energy level to another, one orbital to another, and they're just nothing, they've got nothing that they can do to deal with infrared light. They just let it go by. Ah, you know, this is, I, I can't handle this. Um, the same is true of simple molecules like the diatomic molecules like nitrogen, with two nitrogen atoms, and oxygen, two oxygen atoms. Again, nothing they can do with, with the infrared light associated with thermal radiation. They're just transparent, as, you know, beautifully transparent. Where that stops then is at the, at the diatomic molecules. You get to the triatomic molecules, three atoms and one molecule, and beyond, now they can start to interact with infrared light. They've got ways to deal with it in terms of their vibrations and ro rotations. And carbon dioxide and water, both of them, are quite capable of interacting with infrared light. So changing the amount of water, of, of, of water and of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere changes its transparency in the infrared. And there's much, much hand-wringing over what to, how to deal with water. Because, of course, water is very common. It's all over the place. It's in the air everywhere. But it's been like that for millions of years. And so it's, it's sort of things have, have kind of stabilized out. The, the presence of water is, is, is sort of baked into the system. What's not baked into the system is carbon dioxide. And so we're, as, as, as humankind generates more and more carbon dioxide, they're darkening the Earth's atmosphere in the infrared. Uh, other molecules also contribute, like methane. The, actually, the more complicated the molecule gets to, to a large extent, the darker it is, the more inky, inky stinky it becomes. So methane, um, some of the other chemicals of modern life, including some of the ones associated with air conditioners, which, which I'll come to, these complicated molecules are, are real, quite dark in the infrared, and you, know, you just want to keep them out of the atmosphere. So as we darken the Earth's atmosphere, what are the consequences? The, 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 in this view of, of how the Earth, Earth gets its temperature, the consequence of spitting more carbon dioxide into the Earth's atmosphere is to raise the altitude of the surface from which the thermal radiation comes. So instead of being five kilometers up, as we put more junk into the air, we, we crank that height up from five kilometers to 5.1 kilometers to 5.2. Let's suppose we went all the way to six kilometers. If we, went, if, if we, if we darken the atmosphere to the point where the, the thermal radiation originates on average from six kilometers, then the minus 18 degree surface is up there at six kilometers. And by the time you work your way back down to where we live, 
you've gone through six kilometers of that thermal gradient. And, and instead of going up 33 degrees, as, as, as was for, you know, for, the, for, the five, for the five kilometer uh, altitude, at six kilometers, you're up to 21.6. Uh, no, 33, 39 point something. So 39-ish degrees of temperature rise. So down here where we live, instead of being 15 Celsius, it would be 21 Celsius, which is too hot. We do not want that. All right? So ultimately, we want to stop putting atmosphere darkening chemicals into the Earth's atmosphere. Carbon dioxide for sure. And then the other ones we've got to be careful with as well. Some of the other ones, and the issues are sort of complicated. It's not just that you put it in the air, it's, it's how long it, it lives in the air, how long it remains up there. And some of the chemicals that, that, that are quite dark and you put in the air, um, they are, are destroyed very quickly. They don't live very long in the, in the Earth's atmosphere and they come right on back down as something else. So those are sort of less, in, less, uh, less bad, but there are some very long-lived, very dark chemicals and you don't want to put them up there. All right. So that said, I think the ones that we're most worried about, carbon dioxide, certainly. Methane, also certainly. Um, some of the nitrogen oxides are bad, too. Um, it, this is a, you know, I don't know what to say, it's the problem you, you all will be facing in your lifetime, but it's, it's way up there on the list. And the people who are, okay, so I just, uh, you know, trying to, try to say non-political here, but the people who, who imagine that this is a myth with some political agenda, alas, are just living with their hands, you know, their heads in the sand. It's, it, you know, and who's responsible? I mean, we don't care and all that, but you know, for whatever reason, you know, if, if it's not humankind doing this, which it is, um, it's happening anyway. So uh, I, would just, I would encourage you to be careful buying oceanfront property. You may well have purchased uh, sub-ocean property. You know, a few years from now, you will own a sandbar, uh, you know, underwater sandbar. Be careful. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, the, it's such a slow creep that, that uh, you know, we can laugh about it now, but, but there will come a time probably, at some point you'll think back. I don't want you thinking back and, and being like tearing your hair out over this, this specific class, but you may, uh, 30 years from now, you all may, may think back and go like, why were we like ignoring this? Why were we just, just letting, you know, for political reasons, just, just pretending it didn't exist or that it was a conspiracy? It's not a conspiracy. It's just, it's just reality. It's just physics. Okay? All right. So with that, I think I'm done with clothing insulation and climate. What about the depletion of the ozone layer? So the depletion of the ozone layer was a crisis of, you know, it was a little before you guys were born for the most part. Um, people realized probably in the 60s-ish that chlorine atoms have a, um, they have a catalytic effect on, on, a, on a chemical that's present in the high atmosphere known as ozone. Normal oxygen atoms are two oxygen atoms glued together by a chemical bond. Ozone is a less stable version of oxygen in which three oxygen atoms are, are, are assembled together. And it's, it's, a, it's a smelly, uh, it's, a, it's a smelly, unstable form of oxygen. It's, it's slightly, uh, is it toxic? It's certainly irritating. Um, it's made by electrical discharges quite easily, and so it was very common in my basement as a kid <laughs> with lots of electrical discharges. So, so I know the smell very well. Um, down here at the Earth's surface, it's considered a pollutant. So ozone's not something you want to have around very much. It's useful for certain, act for certain activities like, like disinfecting uh, pools. They use ozone now for that, for, and for bleaching paper, I think, they use, they use ozone. Um, but it, just, just in everyday experience, it's, it's something you don't really want to have a lot of them around. In the, high in the high atmosphere, it's useful because it absorbs ultraviolet light in the, in the far ultraviolet. It's, it's, 
it's quite dark in that. It's, it's a triatomic molecule, so it's, it's more complicated and it's able to interact with, with, uh, with ultraviolet light. And it, it um, absorbs and basically removes U most UVC. You don't even talk about much about UVC, but a it's a certain portion of the, of the ultraviolet spectrum deep in the ultraviolet. There's UVA, UVB, UVC. I mean, these are sort of arbitrary names for things, but, but there's a deep in the ultraviolet, we don't want that stuff around down here on the Earth because it is an I a form of ionizing radiation. Um, that is, it, it, has, it carries with it pieces of portions of energy that are capable of, of damaging molecules. Um, I, this is not, in this semester, I don't talk about the fact that light carries with it packets of energy known as photons. These are names that are probably somewhat familiar. The, the, the world of quantum physics, uh, lots of stuff actually interacts as quanta, as, as portions. And the, the, the quanta the, uh, that we're talking about in the case of light are quanta of energy, so little energy packets. And the energy packets associated with deep ultraviolet light are big energy packets, and they're big enough to damage molecules and cause things like skin cancer. So we don't want, we don't want that part of the spectrum reaching the Earth's surface. So long story here, ozone does a great job of, of blocking a lot of it, maybe most of it. And losing the ozone from the high atmosphere would be a bad thing. And it, this is maybe one of the first uh, situations in which humankind realized that we are responsible for a problem in the, in the Earth's structure. Uh, it is quite possible for us to mess with the entire Earth, because we were messing with the with the ozone layer in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, I'm sure it was controversial initially, and then eventually people realized, you know, this is true. When we send chlorine up there, it, uh, it causes catalytic destruction of the ozone, which is to say that the chlorine gets involved in destroying the ozone, but the chlorine comes back out of the situation. So the chlorine participates in the chemical reaction, but is regenerated at the end. So chlorine goes in, blah, 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 ozone's gone, and the chlorine comes back out to, to be used again. So the chlorine can over and over destroys one ozone molecule, two, five, ten, hundred. 10, 100. So get the chlorine out of there. And so where was the chlorine coming from? The main source, I, as far as I know, of chlorine was coming from the chemical that was used in refrigerants, as a refrigerant, freons. The chemicals that were used in air conditioners and refrigerators, um, and relevant to, the, to what I'll talk about very soon. Uh, and so those were chlorofluorocarbons. So they were, they were somewhat complicated molecules that had chlorines in them, and they would float around the Earth's atmosphere, and they would work their way up into the upper atmosphere, where they would ultimately uh, lead to the presence of, of active chlorine atoms that would then destroy ozone molecules by, by the dozens or hundreds or thousands or millions. So we got, we, uh, you know, as, as a humankind managed to basically ban the freons. So, that the, and as a result, the ozone is sort of back to normal. It, but it was a whole arc of tens of years, uh, the tens of years of the destruction of being, being uh, observed, and then tens of years of the, uh, of the destruction being healed by the shutdown of the production of, of freons. So, a, a takeaway from that is that we actually can really change how the Earth operates. And uh, we did it with ozone, and we're going to do it. We're in the midst of doing it with carbon dioxide. All right? Yeah. How do the chlorine atoms basically get recycled and reused? So, so this is an example of, of catalysis. You, you all have encountered the the notion of, it, of catalysis somewhere or other, for example, catalytic converters in cars. A catalyst is something that participates and facilitates a chemical reaction, but that doesn't get consumed by it. So it comes out of the chemical reaction essentially as it was. So it goes through some sort of cycle and then pops right back out. And, and the exact cycle that was involved in chlorine and ozone, I don't, I don't know or remember. I mean, I've seen it before. And, and, and I, had a, I had a professor as an undergraduate who was working on this cycle and was, was one of the early people to say, you know, hey, hey, this is, pro this is a problem. Um, but, but, it, but it is a cycle. The chlorine atom doesn't get 
consumed by it. It comes out at the end to be reused. And so catalysts are very useful. You, obviously, the catalytic converter in your car, it, its job is to do things like to take nitrogen oxides that would be produced by the car and it would become pollutants and um, cycle them out to become nitrogen and oxygen again, nitrogen and carbon dioxide probably again, or, or to take the unburned gasoline molecules and to finish the burning of them chemically so they come out as water and carbon dioxide. But the catalytic converter goes through the cycle and comes back out. It's, it's unchanged, essentially, over and over and over. Is that OK? Other questions? Yeah. The, 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 the chlorine atoms is a free radical reaction. So it's, the chlorine's a free radical itself. Yeah. OK. I, for, for those of you who don't know, free radical is an unpaired electron. Some, some of the chemical the, many of the, the, the chemical constituents of life are essentially all organic molecules. They're all held together by what are covalent bonds. You've encountered these probably in chemistry and stuff like that. Covalent bonds is, involves two electrons. Um, it's a long, too long a story to do in any detail. But a single electron, try, sort of the half a bond, um, is very hungry for other electrons. And so um, it likes pairing. Electrons like pairing. It's, it's, it's driven by energy and the desire to reduce total potential energy as quickly as possible. Getting a second electron in there would reduce the total potential energy as quickly as possible. Anyway, other, other questions? All right. OK. With that, then let me, let me switch gears completely. And I'll, and I'll start the introduction of, of uh, air conditioners, start the story of air conditioners. So where this fits into the scheme of things is that we've already seen I you know, talked about been talking about thermal thermal energy and the flow of heat um, now for a bunch of topics. And you've seen already that, that heat naturally flows from a hot object to a cold object. And it, it does that. I, I, I've said sort of peripherally that, that that's driven by statistics. It's statistically likely for heat to go from a hot object to a cold object. Um, and the reverse is not not so likely. Well, the air conditioner does the, in that kind of does this sort of the seemingly impossible. It moves heat the wrong way. It makes your, on, on, a, on, a, on a hot day when you're, you come home from vacation and your house is at the same temperatures outdoors and you switch on the air conditioner, the air conditioner does this crazy thing. It moves heat out of your room air into the outdoor air. And your room gets colder and the outdoor air gets hotter. And that keeps happening. You know, it keeps doing that. So heat is moving from the cold room air to the hot outdoor air, the, which is the wrong way. Are you okay with the idea that's the wrong way? Heat wants to do the reverse. And actually, it's, it will do everything it can to do the reverse. So maintaining this arrangement where you've got cold room air and hot outdoor air requires perpetual effort, because the heat's going to keep leaking back in. It wants to go the other way. So how does it manage to do that? Isn't that like impossible? No, it's, it by, that by itself is statistically unlikely and won't happen. Heat, won't, heat isn't going to naturally flow from your room air to the outdoor air and make your room colder and the outdoor air hotter. That won't happen by chance. It's got to be done deliberately. And the, the, the kind of device that does this, that moves heat against its natural direction of flow, is called a heat pump. And the idea is you're actually you're pumping heat. You're making heat go the way it doesn't want to go. And it's consistent with, all, with the, 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 the title, the, the, the word pump, in general means moving stuff the way it doesn't want to go. You pump water. You take it from low to high. That, that requires pumping water. Um, I often talk about a battery as a pump for electric charge. It moves it from where it wants to be to where it doesn't want to be. The positive charge, you pump it away from the negative charge that it likes to, and pile it up near positive charge where it hates. That's pumping. So, Physics and the, and, the, and the world is full of things that pump, that move stuff against its natural flow. And, and this is now, the air conditioner is a case of a heat pump. And you know, how, is it, how is it able to do this? Uh, rather than, than try to go into the laws of thermodynamics, that, that would be sort of the, the next step in, in showing you how this can happen, let me show you that it is possible to play with heat. And 
underlying the, the playing with heat and moving heat is that you can move it. You can move it the wrong way, but there's always a cost to moving it the wrong way. I mean, it shouldn't be any surprise. The act of pumping stuff always involves a cost. You consume something. If you want to pump water, you consume energy to pump water from low to high, to fill a, a water tower. You consume energy. If you want to pump um, electric charge from where it likes to be to where it doesn't like to be, you, as a battery, you consume something. You consume the, the chemical potential energy in the battery. It gets worn out. If you want to pump heat, you, it, that requires consuming something a little more exotic, which is order. You have to consume orderly stuff and destroy the order in it. And what's orderly stuff? Well, an, an, example, an example, here's an example of orderly stuff. Let me look down on this stock camera. Is this going to work for us? Yes. OK. That is an orderly arrangement of beads. White beads on one side, purple beads on the other. This doesn't happen by chance. This is, this, an orderly arrangement like this is hard to come by. And once you um, interact with it, you tend to destroy the order. And once it's destroyed, you never get it back. So for example, I got the beads like that. If I stir them, it, hmm? don't, do it. don't do it, don't do it. Ah! <laughs> All right? OK? I, I've, I've lost the order. I've destroyed the order. And once you've done that, I can't undo it. You can't unstir. You put milk in your coffee, you can't unstir it. You've lost the order. And it's driven by statistics rather than the laws of motion, but it's just as effective. You can't, there's no way I'm going to ever manage to unstir those guys. So I've consumed order in this. In this case, I've consumed the order for no purpose except for fun. Um, what I want to do is, you know, I can. Um, what I want to show you then is, is if you're willing to, to consume order, to do something that, that, that this, was, this was wanton waste of order, OK? Just sheer destruction. But I can consume order to do something more interesting, like move heat from hot to cold. And, the, and a way to do that is just by compressing and uncompressing a gas. I already told you, waved my hands and told you earlier today, that if you take a, a bag full of air and you carry it up to great height so that it expands, as the pressure drops, it gets colder. So expanding a gas makes it colder. And bringing it back down and squeezing it, compressing it, makes it hotter. There already is an is a idea. You can actually move heat around in kind of an interesting way if you're willing to squeeze stuff and unsqueeze stuff. And the squeezing and unsqueezing involves consuming some order in yourself to do the squeezing. So I am going to consume some, some personal order here to move air around. I'm going to. So we got a, temp a temperature sensor inside this bottle of air, just bottle of air, and the temperature sensor right now is reading room temperature. And I'm now going to pack extra air into it with a bicycle pump, and it's getting hotter. It really is getting hotter, and not because of friction, but because I'm doing work on the air, pumping it in. All right? And once it pumped out, watch what happens to the temperature. Cold, right off the screen, right? That's all real. As I pumped air into the container, packing it in, I did work on it, which means I gave it energy. I gave the air energy. And the air can only do one thing with its energy as a, as a gas. It has no other places to put it. It puts it into the thermal energy. So the air gets hotter. So the air got hotter while I was pumping air in, and it became the hottest thing in the room, at which point heat began to flow out into the room because of the old-fashioned heat goes from hot to cold. And then when the, when the, when the cork popped out, the air expanded. It did, did work on the rest of the room air, pushing the air out of the way to make room for itself. And at that point, it used, to do the work, it used the only energy that the air's got, which is thermal energy, and it got colder. So between compressing and uncompressing air, you can begin to move heat around strategically. But it, it has a cost. It has cost in the act of compressing and uncompressing the air. You're interacting with it, and you're consuming some of your own order in the process of doing that. And that's where I'll, I'll go with air conditioners, how they're, actually, they're deliberately moving heat around.